Hey y'all, Data Guy here with the Data Dog making another surprise guest appearance. Um, and today we're going to be talking about what is coming up in the new Apache Spark 4.0 release. Um, so we just had the big Apache Airflow 3.0 release. Now we got Spark 4.0 coming out. Um, it is going to come out sometime this summer. There isn't a hard date on it yet as far as I know, but they have published the beta release candidates. Um, so there is an understanding of, hey, what features are going to be coming out. Um, you can download uh, the beta Spark image if you want to go run it yourself. Obviously not recommended for production workloads, but great way to get informed on what's going to be coming up. And the contents that update are what we're going to discuss here in this video. Um, so I'm going to be taking you through all the new and relevant features that are going to be coming and all the big changes uh, to Spark that are happening within the Apache Spark 4.0 release. Um, so. Without further ado, let's get into it. Um, and if you like these videos, please like, subscribe, uh, join my Patreon if you want to see videos a week in advance. Um, and let's get into it. So the first kind of big implementation and something that actually already came out in Spark 3.4, uh, but is becoming even more uh, prevalent within the new Spark 4.0 release is the Spark Connect client server protocol. Um, which is a new way to decouple the actual Spark driver, you know, the Spark cluster itself, from the application, the notebook, the programming language, you know, this Python script, your PySpark script. And um, now instead of direct in connecting directly to the Spark cluster itself, it'll be connecting through the Spark Connect API um, to trigger the job uh, on that actual Spark cluster. Um, and the main benefit of this, or one of the main benefits, is it no longer requires a full Spark ins installation um, within wherever you're running, you know, your notebook, your application. Uh, so it allows you to have a much more lightweight way uh, through the lightweight client, the thin client, um, that is installable via the PySpark Connect uh, package um, to just connect to Spark, run the code there, but not actually need to run and create an entire Spark session within your own environment. Um, also, gives much better cross-language support, um, so facilitates you, you know, developing Python, Scala, Java, Go, more because now you have a common API for any type of application or notebook or language to interact with Spark. Um, and then it also, you know, it's just going to allow, you know, much tighter integration with your IDEs and notebooks with that thin client connecting to the API and then serving the responses back without necessarily needing to install a full Spark session in every single notebook that uses it. Um, so huge quality of life and also just, you know, nice removal of previous heavyweight overhead. So the next big feature, um, you know, kind of just, I guess, general improvement uh, for Spark um, is now ANSI SQL mode is enabled by default. Um, so this is kind of an under the hood chain, uh, change, but it is something that will have a good impact on your day-to-day -day life um, and also help make your SQL behavior way more standards compliant. Um, because previously, you know, Spark would retur silently return null for errors like divide by zero or the example up on the screen, um, where, you know, you have some kind of data frame where it isn't, you know, a strict error um, and the task just gets aborted, right? Um, or re returns a silent null. Um, now it will actually raise exceptions, like in this example, um, where you actually will have an error uh, raised, and so then you, you know, trigger any downstream alerting rather than just a silent null, which is just returned like any other value. Um, and so if you didn't have you know things in place to catch null values, um, you would you know, be exposed to data quality issues. You know, you're just getting no data um, from bad operations. But now you have those errors, um, and you know similar to traditional relational database behavior, you know, just kind of normal thing to have, kind of weird that Spark didn't have it enabled by default, but really great for having safer pipelines, um, catching mistakes like a casting issue or an invalid join earlier, um, and preventing that silent data corruption, uh, as well as making it easier to port workloads from traditional data warehouses like Postgres, SQL, or Oracle, because it'll have the same behavior. Uh, so just nice little quality of life under the hood improvement. So the next quality of life improvement, uh, also semi-related to ANSI SQL, um, is collation support for string comparisons. So now Spark will support collation rules to define how strings are compared, sorted, grouped, based on case sensitivity, uh, location. Um, so really bringing in a lot more ways to segment your strings automatically um, and you know, kind of build programmatic ways to organize your data and segment it within the context of Spark. Um, so now you have things like correctness for international data. Um, so collations like 
in underscore US versus FR underscore France or FR, uh, ensure correct ordering and comparison of those kind of non-English characters. Um, and then also case sensitivity options, um, you know, setting all to lower or upper or case insensitive comparisons and joins, filters, group buys explicitly, giving you a lot more tools in the toolbox to handle these kind of situations and you know, the obvious variation that comes with raw data. Um, and also, you can specify these collations at the column or expression level. Um, so you, know, you have really fine-grained behavior in how you're defining their SQL expressions. Um, so just really great for you know, giving you more ways to sort your data uh, and do it in efficient programmatic ways, because that's the best way to do it. Now, the next big release is actually kind of a copycat move by Spark, uh, inspired by Snowflake, which, you know, no blame to them the best uh, copy, uh, which is introducing the variant data type. Um, and the variant data type is a schema list column type um, that will support semi-structured JSON-like data natively. Um, so previously in Spark, you had to handle JSON data as a string um, versus now, you know, kind of almost like a MongoDB style, um, you have a schema list column type where you can just store raw JSON, semi-structured JSON data um, and this gives you the option to have a flexible schema which stores structured and nested data in the same column. So you can have JSON nested data and regular data within the same column without needing to have a defined schema for that JSON data up front. Um, it also really helps improve processing times. So it's gonna be much more efficient at parsing um, because now you have an in optimized internal representation of this data type that will avoid the performance penalties that happen you know, when you're using JSON through a us string data type um, and it will be really great for your ingestion layer you know as you can imagine where you know data lake house scenarios you're ingesting inconsistent structures from apis or kafka a uh, really easy way to store that now without needing to convert it to a string um, and just introducing a lot of extra parsing and processing time um, for no real benefit there so now the next thing i want to talk about is really a set of just kind of big advancements within uh, PySpark and that were released or being released in tandem with Py with Spark 4.0. Um, and number one, first big one is array powered user defined functions. Um, so you can now actually, or arrow powered, sorry, UDF uh, functions. Um, so you can actually use Apache Air to dramatically speed up your Python UDF execution. So nice little synergy between Apache projects there. Uh, you also have the option to now write uh, Python data sources. So readers and writers in Python, not just Java or Scala. Um, and user-defined table functions now support dynamic return schemas. So you can have table functions that will deter return different schemas uh, for different runs of that function based on inputs. Um, and number one, you know, kind of with, with Apache Air, some of the benefits you'll see um, are 10x up speed up um, between due to zero copy data sharing between you know, your Java virtual machine and the Python processes itself. Um, also, ability to have custom sources in Python means you no longer need to write those custom readers in Scala. So easier, um, you know, if you're, if you're a Python dev, dev like, like me, it's great. Um, with, you know, for formats like REST APIs, it's a lot easier to use Python um, to interact with. Also, just kind of enhance, uh, there's some enhanced debugging and profiling uh, features that were mentioned in the release notes. I'm not too sure what those are, but always nice to have better and more verbose debugging and logging features. So now the next big set of changes um, and enhancements was to structured streaming in Spark 4.0. Um, so it's actually gotten a lot more flexible and ex expressive, especially for stateful processing. And um, now you can have things like flat map operations and arbitrary stateful processing, where you can create custom state logic like sliding windows or ML feature accumulators um, that run over the stream. Um, and you also can set state store data source now. Um, so you can read and write state directly to storage. So you can actually keep track of state in external databases. So if you're you know, trying to use, keep track of it for debugging or persistence um, after the Spark cluster is turned down, really useful. Um, and this is great for kind of more advanced use cases like fraud detection, real-time alerting, anomaly detection, where you need more control over state transitions and the state logic that occurs as state changes for different operations. Um, so things like this flat map operation um, and also helps to improve fault tolerance because you can checkpoint those states um, and restore from previous states more easily. Um, also, you know, allows you to do things like maintaining a running average of clickstream data or tracking login attempts per user in the last hour. Um, so really nice improvement um, for, you know, a tool that's becoming more and more used as kind of architectures are 
coming to be more event driven, more event based. Um, Spark at streaming, I think, is leaning into that as well. Now, the final thing I want to talk about is, you know, kind of the release also of Delta Lake 4.0 support. Um, so Spark was going to include deep support or, or 4.0 for Delta Lake 4.0. Um, so really enhancing the transactional capabilities of lake house architectures. Again, as lake house architectures move more towards that event-based transactional uh, approach. Um, and so obviously, you know, pairing with Delta Lake, it's the most common catalog and kind of tool for run or lake house running next to Spark, um, is improved reliability, you know, with faster metadata management, checkpointing, you know, just kind of a deep first class integration there, um, the ability to roll back to previous versions of that Delta Lake. Um, so great if you, know, you had a Spark uh, operation that went wrong and it had created some orphan to bad data and you want to roll back before you ran that, good for you. Um, and then also unified streaming and batch. So really, you know, having kind of true stream batch unification for ingestion and queries supported by both tools now. Um, and then you're also going to get all the great features within Delta 4.0, like clustered writes, Z ordering optimizations, native change data capture, which is really cool, um, and, and some other features coming in there. Um, so in summary, uh, that is everything coming out in Spark 4.0. Um, you got Spark Connect improvements, you got ANSI SQL turned on by default, better collation support, the new variant type, um, some PySpark upgrades to you know, just enhance usability um, and also improve performance. Um, same thing with structured streaming, big improvements there, and also the ability to pr uh, improve the and customize the stateful logic uh, applied. Um, also, under the hood, there were some performance and improvements. You know, I, I'm not super in the weeds on those, but you know, just on, Spark is now going to run better natively. Um, and then finally, deep integration with Delta Lake 4.0 for better performance and light and reliability when running it and you're know, kind of in that lake house configuration, um, which is becoming more popular as well. So that is everything I had to talk about today um, in relation to Spark 4.0. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Data Guy out.